Part one. You will hear a man phoning Preston Community Centre to get information about the classes it offers. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, this is Preston Community Centre. Oh, hello. My name's Andrew Shepherd. I'm ringing about the classes you offer. Okay, Mr. Shepherd. Are there any classes in particular that you're interested in? Yes, you've got a class called photography, I believe. That's right. It's the first time we offer this class because many people inquired about it last term. It'll be held in a library, not far from our community centre. Right. I know it's on the weekend, right? Yes, it's on Saturday, and it will occupy the whole morning. Okay. Um, what do I need to bring? Obviously, you have to bring your own camera. Some people bring a lot of accessories, like an extra lens, but there's really no need for this class. It's mainly focusing on composition, really, and getting the most out of the basic camera. That's exactly what I want. Okay, then I've heard there's a class on cooking, right? Yes, it's called French cooking class. As the name suggests, it will teach you cooking skills in French cuisine. Oh, great! Where will that be held? This class is special, so we arrange it in a kitchen where we can get the necessary cooking equipment. Let me see. Yes, the Anita kitchen. As for the time of the course, it used to be on the second Tuesday of every month. But there's a small adjustment this time. Although it's still held on a monthly basis, the exact time will be changed to the first Tuesday. Well, actually, it's my wife who's really interested, and I think it's a good fit for her because our daughter has to take a guitar lesson every Tuesday. So my wife is available. That's good, but I have to remind you that aprons are not provided in this class. So when you do come, please bring one with you in case you get dirty when cooking. What's more, don't forget to bring some money with you, as the ingredients for cooking, like vegetables or meat, have to be paid by yourself. Okay, useful information to know. Then there's another class that my wife would like to join. That's the beading class. Oh, I've taken the class myself. The tutor is excellent. Last term, it was held in a tennis club, which is going to be redecorated soon. So we plan to change this class to a golf club this time, and it'll be held on the evening of every Wednesday. Do I have to bring the beads with me? Yes, that's the only material needed for this class. Okay, I think this class is also a good choice for her. Um, do you have any other classes that I can join? If you like, I think you can take our painting class. It's a popular class, so this term we're going to move it to a high school so that we can get more room. What time will it be? It'll be on every Monday evening. The time's good for me. Do I have to bring the paints? Well, paints will be provided by the tutor. I know that. Um, the information says you'll just need some brushes. I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Okay, just another question about the beading class. I've just remembered my wife asked me to find out the exact time. When will the first class begin? Well, the deadline for registration is April the thirtieth, and we're not going to start the class until May the fifteenth. Okay, what's the fee for this class? It was ninety-five dollars last term, but the cost will be a little more this term. Well, let me check the details. Okay, it'll be one hundred dollars this term, just five dollars more. Sounds reasonable. Then about the location, it's in the club. Which room exactly? Room J fifty two. Okay, just one more question. 
It's parking convenient. I'm sorry to tell you that parking space is only available for the club's premier members. But if you drive, there's a parking lot opposite the club, just beside the station. You need to pay only a small parking fee. Okay, that's all I want to know. I'll call you later after I discuss it with my wife. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Section 2. You'll hear a coordinator for the annual ski and snowboard exhibition talking to the audience about some practical information for the whole event. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the annual Ski and Snowboard Exhibition held from April the 8th to 17th. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The 10-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now... I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you, so for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here, but I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear like always, this year... We have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails, the most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls. In order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the ski programme. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to from the first timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the programme, as it is offering an unprecedented 30% discount. That's mainly because we are cooperating with the programme organiser who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a student called Jerry discussing a pedagogy course with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Jerry, how did it go with preparing your lessons? Is there anything you would like to discuss? Well, this is actually the first time that I have ever taught in an elementary classroom. After eight years of learning pedagogy, I want to practice what I've learned in an instructive manner. But I'm a bit stuck right now. You know the topic I want them to research is a bit hard for pupils. I'm afraid that they won't be able to handle it on their own. So I need new ideas on designing more effective teaching methods. Mr. Carter, do you have any suggestions? Well, you should probably read this book called Professional Learning, written by J.K. Simmons. He is a professor who just transferred here last semester, but is already popular amongst the students for his creative teaching methods. 
There is an extensive range of learning approaches mentioned in the book, including approaches for team research, which might be helpful to you. You mean dividing the students into groups to do research? I've never thought of this before. How does it work? Professor Simmons has already demonstrated how efficient this approach can be. Basically, it aims to increase cooperation between students, so they can present the results in a collaborative fashion. It helps them to develop their own voice and perspective. I'll check out the book as soon as possible. It seems I can borrow some of the essential concepts and work them into my course design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. Well, I was thinking maybe I could use both observation and non-observation as a part of my teaching methodology. Could you take a look at my teaching plan? Sure. What kind of observational methods do you have in mind? For the observational part, I intend to include two approaches. First. The pupils can assess each other's behaviour. I feel that reviewing fellow students through criteria-based reference evaluation allows constructive feedback. It can also improve their understanding of the subject material. That's a smart move for a large class that would be hard to observe all by yourself. Also, you might want to get the feedback from several different individuals rather than just one. So, how do you plan to carry out the peer assessments? Oh, every pupil will be required to write a diary, which includes group projects, presentations, and in-class discussions. They'll put down their remarks. I'll collect them on a regular basis, which can also help me see whether they can keep up or not. Good. What else do you intend to do? Besides that, I also plan to do video recording. I've already purchased a camera, just in case I miss anything important. I can go back and review their performances any time I want. Would you record every in-class activity? No, I'll just keep track of an in-class simulation, which would require every pupil to fully participate. Students will act as members of a city council meeting, discussing issues like whether or not prohibition should be instated in the United States. This kind of teaching method is both inspiring and challenging. I can't wait to see how yours works out. Do send me a copy of the assessment afterwards, will you? No problem. So, what do you have in mind for the non-observational approaches? Well, my plan is to quantify the statistics. Numbers do not lie. It is the most direct way to measure their performance. See how well they've learned. Where does the data come from? I'll evaluate the test results, including the midterm, final exam, and pop quizzes, which would only take up about forty percent of the overall assessment. Sounds like a lot of tests and assignments. Please remember that you don't want to wear out your students. Keeping them engaged is the key to efficient learning. Once they are exhausted, they just stop trying. Oh, I haven't thought about that. You are right. I don't want to frighten them. With tons of assignments and exams, I'll make note of that. Thanks for the advice. I remember last time you mentioned questionnaires, right? That's true, but it is not for my students. In fact, they have to design their own questionnaires and choose the respondents using the internet. As a complement of other teaching activities, it would deepen the creative learning process. Is that all? Oh. The pupils will have to conduct interviews of their own, and for this, they get to choose anyone they like, including relatives, friends, and acquaintances, to answer the questions. Seems to me that you have figured out most of your teaching methods, but you still need to polish some of the activities.
That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about urban migration. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on urban migration today. The world has experienced unprecedented urban growth in the recent decade. As much as three percent of Earth's landmass has been urbanized, an increase of at least fifty percent over previous estimates. Today. People living in cities already outnumber those in rural areas, and the trend does not appear to be reversing. In addition, cities have larger amounts of carbon consumption than rural areas. This is a result from two major aspects. First, with the increase of urban population around the world, the massive construction of urban infrastructure and residential housing is hard to avoid. Second. Urban households have a higher rate of car ownership, and use more gasoline products. Even though rural exodus is often negatively judged, there are also benefits of migration shared by the local environment and the society as a whole. Well, firstly, global trends of increasing urban migration and population urbanization can provide opportunities. For nature conservations, particularly in regions where deforestation is driven by agriculture, as rural dwellers leave their homes, local forests are left to recover. What's more, it is easier for city dwellers to get around. Living in the country means transport can be very difficult. For instance, after midnight, there are no buses or taxis in the countryside. However, there is still a number of public transport modes to choose from in the city. Finally, with more funds and advanced technology, cities endeavour to produce clean energy. New power plants have been built to take harmful methane gas created by the decomposition of rubbish and convert it into electricity. By doing so, an important greenhouse gas is turned into useful energy. Rather than being directly emitted into the atmosphere, the hustle and bustle of city life offers women the opportunity to explore different professions and pursue their own careers. Women in cities work as engineers, managers, and even football players. This change of roles has affected their marital status and family life. More women are choosing their careers over marriage. Which raises the graph of late marriages. As a result, more are remaining single, well into their late thirties. They want to be independent and earn money on their own. It is also easier for them to get a promotion while working in the city. Women are slowly achieving wider participation at work, while in rural areas the mindset is still very conservative. However, cities also change the way that humans interact with each other and the environment, often causing multiple problems. 
In general, urban wages are significantly higher, so moving to the city is an opportunity to earn what was impossible in rural areas. However, the wage difference is often offset by the higher cost of living and absence of self-produced goods, including substance farming. A sizable proportion of new corners attach greater importance to money and gradually abandon their former way of life, thus risking losing their culture. These new city residents are also faced with another problem. According to statistics, crime rates are significantly higher in densely populated urban regions than in rural areas. For instance, property crime rates in our metropolitan areas are three to four times as high in comparison to the rates in rural communities. Immigrants upon arrival into cities typically move into the poor, blighted neighborhoods because that is where they can afford to live. Crime in these areas is high and reflects poor living conditions as these neighborhoods experience great levels of poverty. This pattern also occurs for violent crimes, which is much more common in large urban areas than elsewhere. In addition, traffic congestion and industrial manufacturing are prominent features of the urban landscape, which take their toll on the natural environment and those who depend on it. Air pollution from both cars and factory emissions affect the health of countless urban residents. Rural to urban migration can boost the urban economy. With a better economy, cities provide their residents with better welfare, but the concentration of services and facilities such as education, health and technology in urban areas inevitably contributes to greater energy consumption. Another problem with life in the city is traffic congestion. It makes people late to work and thus stresses us out before we even get there. Deliveries can't arrive on time, gas costs money, the quality of life of those commuters starts to decline. What's worse is that if congestion makes it harder to match the right workers to the best jobs, it is economically inefficient as well. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.